All right, so let's start. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Native Essentials, a 101 tutorial to you start your cloud native journey. Uh, first off, a little bit about us. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Eamon Bauman. I am a uh, solutions architect at Red Hat, formerly with, uh, worked with uh, Ray at Sousa, and uh, was an architect at uh, Rancher for a period of time. So excited to be up here and uh, help and deliver this talk. And I'm Ray Lahano. I am a cloud native solution uh, architect at SUSE uh, by way of Rancher Labs. Um, I'm also a senior staff ambassador as well. I also uh, it was a Kubernetes release lead, and I'm a co chair for SIG, Kubernetes SIG Docs and a sub project lead for Kubernetes SIG security. So I do a few things in the community. So um, when I first started, I had a hard time like wh where to start in my cloud native journey. I'm sure everyone here has seen the cloud native landscape, and it is uh, mind boggling, and it is hard to determine where is a good place to start. Uh, so even uh, with specific sections like container runtime, there is uh, a lot of uh, projects for container runtimes. How do you know which one to choose? Same thing with, uh, with scheduling and orchestration. Uh, do we use Crossplane? Do we use Kubernetes? Do we use Keda? Like, there's so many options on what to choose. So where do we start? Uh, like, where do we go from which project to this project to another project? So I took the the um, inspiration from a sextant. I had one in my garage growing up. My dad was a merchant marine, and a sextant uh, takes two points of reference to find latitude. So I, we took exp um, inspiration from a sextant. And we're, we are taking two points of reference to determine our cloud native journey. Uh, the first one being uh, graduated projects uh, with the CNCF. And there's a filter uh, in the cloud native landscape to find out, uh, to find graduated projects. But it's still hard. There's still multiple choices. So where do we go from there? Uh, there's 24 CNCF graduated projects, the first one being Kubernetes. Uh, the ones highlighted here is what we are going to get hands-on with at the uh, hands-on portion of this tutorial. Uh, so we will talk for about half an hour or so, then we'll get hands-on. Uh, so we're, the first one was Kubernetes, and the, last, the latest one was Cilium. So these are the projects that we'll go through and we will briefly talk about in the next few slides here. So the second point of reference we need to determine our cloud native journey is this cloud native trail map. Uh, so this was published in 2018 from the CNCF. This was uh, published to help organizations and guide organizations on their own cloud native journey. Uh, but it's still at the enterprise level or the organization level. Uh, still difficult to manage on a personal level if you're uh, learning about cloud native. Uh, we'll go through not every single one and we won't go through uh, the order, exact order of the cloud native trail map, uh, but we will pretty much go through most of them. Uh, starting off with uh, containerization. So with containerization, of course, Docker popularized uh, containers. Uh, Docker also donated container D uh, to the CNCF as well. But before we talk about uh, containerization, I do want to bring up the Open Container Initiative, which, which came about in about 2015. The Open Container Initiative, or the OCI, uh, standardized lots of things with containers. It standardized the container runtime spec, the container image spec, and the, lastly in 2020, the distribution. That means if you have an OCI compliant uh, container image, it can run on any OCI compliant container runtime. So if you have created a container image on Podman or on Docker, you can run it on container D or you can run it on Podman or Cryo. And thank you to Docker for donating many things to the OCI, like, the, like its container format, uh, the runtime, uh, RunC, and donated many things to the Open Container Initiative. So why do we containerize? Because uh, it solves lots of problems, and this is just a few of them. Once, uh, one, it just works on my machine, and, but it doesn't work on the server. It also solves uh, utilization of the server as well. So with containerization, we take the application source code on the left here, and we take the application dependencies on the right, and we build a layered container image, starting off with the base layer. Uh, this container image is read-only. 
There, so since it's read only, so therefore it is immutable. So whenever we execute a container, it gives us that same execution state every time. So next we're gonna go to container registry and runtime. Starting off with a container. So whenever we have a container, we use a container runtime like container D. Underneath, under the covers of Docker is actually container D and run C. To, uh, to take this container image that is immutable, which is stacks of read-only layers, then it will add on a read-write layer on top of that. So, we need, so we, once we have our container image, we need a place to host container images. We do that with a registry. So we take the container image that uh, we built on our local machine, or, or also from a pipeline as well, and we push that container image to a container registry. Uh, from that container registry, we could then use our container images that we could pull from and have running instances of that container. For the container registry, Harbor is a CNCF graduated project that we will use during the hands-on portion of this tutorial. So the next stop on our cloud native journey after container registry and, and after container runtime is of course orchestration. So with container orchestration, we need uh, an orchestrator. If we, in case you're running multiple containers, that gets very complicated. It is easy to know is where, if you're running very few containers, it's easy to know where they're running, uh, what they're running, what ports they expose. So we have complexities if you're running multiple containers and on lots of many different machines. So how do we solve this? How do we solve automation? How do we solve orchestration? How do we solve security? How do we solve networking? And we do that with the Kubernetes project, which of course is the first CNCF graduated project. Under the covers of Kubernetes in each worker node in a cluster is a node agent called the kubelet. That kubelet gets the container runtime running on that worker node to start uh, containers on that worker node. Next, after orchestration on our cloud native journey, we're gonna go into networking because in Kubernetes, uh, networking, the Kubernetes network model is not implemented until you have a networking plugin. The Kubernetes network model says that containers within, in a pod talk to each other and they actually share the same network namespace. Uh, that pod itself gets a virtual IP address as well. And that pod on any worker node can communicate to any other pod on any other worker node. Uh, same with services could route to pods as well. Uh, as well. And services is a way to abstract uh, a group of pods to give, uh, so it gives a DNS identity and a virtual IP for a service. Uh, some networking plug plugins as well will have network policies so you could actually uh, control ingress and egress, those traffic into and out of the pods. So for networking, we're going to take a look at Cilium and install Cilium. Cilium is the latest uh, CNCF graduated project and that was just, I think last month or two months ago. So with Cilium, it ha does have enhanced uh, security uh, and functionality and features and observability as well. So for our, our after networking, once you have networking a CNI plugin installed in Kubernetes, that's actually when your cluster is actually at a ready state. So next we'll take a look at application definition. So we're not taking a look at Kubernetes again, we're taking a look at Helm in this case. So with applications, applications are not as simple as running a single container. Uh, applications have other requirements. They might, they might, you might need to scale your application. So you might create a resource like a deployment, which uh, sets a number of replicas, identical replicas of a pod. You might have to uh, expose your, your, your application through a service and an ingress to so get an URL uh, for your application. Uh, there's also, and if your application is, let's say, stateful and persistent, you might use a, you might use a stateful set that has a ordered and sticky identity for the pod and your containers in the pod uh, to persistent volumes within the cluster. So there's a lot of complexity with just deploying an application. So the Helm project, which was, uh, is also a CNCF graduate project, uh, gives that ability to pretty much group all these dependencies all into what's called a Helm chart. 
So we'll use Helm in our tutorial as well uh, to deploy uh, monitoring and other applications to our Kubernetes cluster, uh, all using a Helm chart. Next, after our application definition, uh, we're talking about, next we'll look at some day two tools into our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we'll, start, we'll start off with observability as well and logs. So we'll move on into observability, which there are uh, three uh, columns of observability, metrics, logs, and traces. Uh, some people have added events as well. So some people have referred to this as melt for metrics, events, logs, and traces but we'll first take a look at metrics. So metrics during our tutorial, during our hands-on portion, uh, we will deploy Prometheus. Uh, and Prometheus is a modern toolkit that will store metrics as time series data. And we'll do a few uh, or a single PromQL uh, execution as well. With Prometheus, it, do, it does use its own querying language to actually extract uh, that data. And so next, after uh, metrics, we'll look into observability with logs. <laughs> so logs with containers are typically out um, in standard out or in standard error. So in Kubernetes, you typically get your logs by writing uh, cube control logs and the namespace and the pod name. But there's some complexities with that as well. Let's say if your application is running uh, multiple pods and how to get those, those logs, so you could also use labels as well. You could get keep control lo uh, logs in the namespace and dash L to filter out pods with the label app equals nginx in this case. Uh, but in the Kubernetes documentation actually recommends uh, a logging backend and a logging agent to send to that logging backend. So we're actually gonna take a look and use FluentD. And FluentD is a CNCF graduated project as well, and it's used to, uh, for unified data and log collection as well. So lastly, with our cloud native tutorial here, we're gonna look at um, policy. And for policy, we're going to look at the open policy agent. But first off, reason why we need policy, because you can't have a, uh, any kind of resource deployed in your cluster. You can't have cluster roles that, that could do everything. You can't have roles that could do everything. Uh, you can't have pods in the default namespace, or, it's, or you can't have uh, prob, uh, pods with containers with privilege escalation as well, or no labels on pods. So how do we enforce uh, policies and, gu and guide rails in our Kubernetes cluster? Otherwise, you'll have the Wild West in your, in your Kubernetes cluster. So we don't want that, we want to have uh, certain policies that we want to enforce in our Kubernetes cluster. So we'll use uh, the open policy agent, uh, specifically Gatekeeper in our, in our tutorial. Uh, and OPA is, in, is an admission controller, so you could validate uh, or mutate re admission or requests as well. So when a request to create a, sp a resource uh, hits before it actually goes, uh, is, is persistent in the cluster, uh, open policy agent will actually intercept that. It will validate it against its, the policies that you have uh, set in, installed and enforced, and it will check to see if, if, the, if it meets those policies. If it does, it will, then it will create uh, that object. So now time for the hands-on portion of the, uh, this tutorial. We're all going to, uh, it's browser-based, so Hobby Farm uh, is an open source project. Uh, it was created by Eamon. Um, so we are going to take a few minutes first to uh, log into lab.cloudnativeessentials.com. I do want to make a note of a few things. Uh, the slides in the lab are actually are, are uploaded on GitHub uh, with the organization Cloud Native Essentials uh, repo KubeCon 2023. Uh, if there's any issues with the lab, uh, we do have a YouTube playlist of the lab itself as well, and we have the steps, like I mentioned, uh, in the GitHub repo. Oh, okay. uh, so I'm going to go into Hobby Farm. We're going to walk you through it. So if you have a computer, hopefully uh, you'll go to lab.cloudnativeessentials.com. Uh, you want to... Uh, log in, uh, register with uh, your email or password, um, and the access code is kubecon23. 
So I'll keep this up for a little bit. So once you create your credential, it's going to have you uh, refresh and log in. So I'm going to log in here. And most, you, know, you should see a scenario here. Uh, if you don't, just uh, hit refresh or check the access code. So you want to go on the upper right to check the access code. Uh, click on the drop down menu and go to manage access codes. And uh, you can add that access code or make sure uh, there's no typos. I'm going to give a few minutes here. I'm going to, for those who are here, um, if you're ready at start scenario, what this scenario is going to do, you are going to, it's going to spin up uh, two virtual machines per person on AWS. Uh, each one virtual machine will be for Harbor and for Docker. The second virtual machine will be for ContainerD, Kubernetes, and uh, all the other tooling, all the other CNCF graduate projects like Cilium, Prometheus, and uh, OPA. Okay. So I'm going to click on start scenario. We're going to wait a few minutes here um, for our instance to come up, and we'll wait for the, the green check mark uh, once the status is up and running. So it might take a few minutes, so bear with us. Oh. All right. Uh, if it's spinning for you, just refresh the page and uh, hit continue here. few minutes here while the uh, instances are coming up. Yeah, we had provisioned what we thought was enough capacity for this, but I think we're getting the hug of death. I think there's quite a few more people in the room than uh, we had originally expected. So appreciate your time and, and patience with that. Um, while we're waiting for those VMs to come up and get provisioned for everybody, a little background on what we're doing here. This is the Hobby Farm platform. Uh, originally, that we built at uh, SUSE. Now it's a fully open source um, product, has been for a while. And uh, the idea behind it is it's a cloud-native learning platform. So you can spin up virtual machines in a provider of your choice. AWS, we've got um, providers for DigitalOcean, Hetzner, things like that. And inside Hobby Farm, we can create scenarios, courses, multi-day training events that are going to be kind of similar, um, if you're familiar with something like Katakota, for example, similar in concept to that, where you've got content on the left, you can walk through the steps, you can execute commands in your virtual machines, and go on and learn through all this content. Um, so we've been working on that for a while. It's out on GitHub if you guys want to check it out, github.com slash Hobby Farm. We've got a few of the developers in the room, so great to have them here. Uh, this will just take a second. As you see, uh, Ray's virtual machines are populating here, so we are kind of getting the hug of death. But uh, once, uh, once everybody's up and running, we'll be able to continue. Now just go over a, a high-level overview of the steps. So once we get into Hobby Farm, we, will, we could click right through. Uh, the first part, we'll, you'll get two virtual machines. Uh, one is called Harbor, one is called Kubernetes. 
Uh, in, we'll start off in the Harbor instance where you will uh, install Docker. Uh, well, there's several ways to install all these CNCF pro projects. Uh, there's multiple ways. So you can install Harbor on top of Kubernetes. But in this case, we're actually gonna have a Harbor and use the Harbor installer to install. The one of the requirements is Docker, since it does use Docker Compose. Uh, so we'll install Docker. Uh, we'll go through the basics of creating a, a container. So we'll create a simple Golang container uh, as well, make sure it runs. Then we'll install Harbor itself with after installing Docker Compose. Uh, after with Harbor up, then we'll push our newly created container image. Then we'll also pull it as well to make sure we can pull uh, from that registry. Uh, then the next few steps are on the Kubernetes virtual machine, uh, which we will install uh, container D. We're going to use container D as the uh, container runtime interface container to run the Kubernetes we'll use to run containers. And with, with container D, there's several prereqs. So you, uh, we will install uh, several uh, kernel modules like overlay and VRNet filter. Uh, we'll also install uh, run C as well uh, with, with container D uh, too. And then once we get container D up and running, uh, we will install the Kubernetes prereqs as well. We won't use packages to install Kubernetes. We're going to, uh, to install Kubernetes uh, with, with kubeadm. So we will download kubeadm, kubectl, kubelet, uh, download the systemd unit files as well for Kubernetes. Uh, then with, once we get Kubernetes up and running, it's just a single node cluster. Uh, we'll also check to see if the cluster is ready. Uh, there's more requirements with a Kubernetes cluster. If you've ever used kubeadm, like it needs a, a CNI plugin uh, to install or to install for it to implement that Kubernetes network model. So we'll install Cilium as well. We'll install the, the Cilium CLI tool and to, to install Cilium. Uh, once we have the cluster fully ready, we'll go through the Kubernetes basics of a pod uh, deployment uh, service. Uh, Etc. Then uh, we will go through uh, installing the day two tools to manage a cluster. Like we'll go through monitoring. We'll install Prometheus using a Helm chart, so we'll install Helm. Uh, then we will install uh, OPA OPA Gatekeeper uh, for that policy enforcement as well. So. You have a backup of YouTube videos, <laughs> just in case. Some people have, uh, have it up and running. All right, I'll try it. Okay, perfect. Go. So we have it running. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. I think conference Wi-Fi is also hurting us. There. That's, yeah. Oh. I see it come up and down, but... Uh, Let me try Chrome. Yeah. That's also a possibility. So if you have it up and running, feel free to, uh, to uh, continue as well. All right, looks like. All right, since some folks are having, I'm going to start uh, just playing some of the first video and see if we can. So this is just about just logging into uh, the hobby farm scenario. Um, so once you have the, uh, your instances up, I, I'm glad to hear some people have their instances up and running. Let me see if mine ever come up yet. Okay. Do you want to use mine? Yours is up too? <laughs> um. 
Okay, well, yeah. Let's see. Uh... Thank you. Uh, we have VMs up. So on the right here, uh, hopefully you have your virtual machines up uh, and running. Um, you have a tab uh, for your, har your Harbor instance and a tab for your Kubernetes virtual machine. Uh, notice you have a public IP, private IP host name uh, as well. Uh, the first several steps you're gonna go use are using the Harbor uh, instance here. So let's make sure I could do commands. It's a little slow. So uh, most of this is gonna be click to run. Like I mentioned, you do have the steps saved on GitHub, so you could also uh, get these steps to run, run it on your own machines as well. Uh, the first step here, we are actually um, going to, did you install, you didn't install Docker yet, right? Okay. 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 So uh, just to walk through folks, if you haven't done this yet, uh, we're going to install Docker do a wget uh, to get uh, to install Docker, run through the Docker installer. Uh, then once the Docker installer is finished, uh, you will add your the user to the Docker group. So you can do Docker commands without doing sudo Docker. Uh, next, you will uh, activate the changes to the Docker group with new group Docker. Uh, and then simple test run is just Docker version. Otherwise it will error out and you would have to do sudo Docker version. Uh, next up here, we'll create a simp uh, very simple Golang application here. Uh, to do that, we need to install Golang. So we'll install Golang. So this will take a few minutes here. Uh, throughout these steps, we'll do uh, all the SHA-256 uh, checksum checks as well. So um, that's just best practice to do. So we, we did add those steps here as well. All right, and that looks good. Uh, then we'll extract Golang as well to the slash user slash local. The next step here is to add a uh, goes path, goes path to the, your profile as well. So we'll click on this, this said. Then we'll actually go into our application installation. Uh, we'll make a directory called simple app. And this is just very, very simple. Um, I actually wanted to make it more simple, but uh, <laughs> so this will install uh, a web server and I'll do a user OS uh, module to tell you what the host name is of this application. So let's test it with using go run. So this will take a minute. Uh, once you see server is starting, you can see the host name is the host name of this virtual machine. Uh, there is a trick here. You have to do control C to cancel, or it looks like I did that already. Okay. Uh, next is that we will containerize this simple Golang application. We're gonna use a Docker file. Uh, and a Docker file is a text file, text file on how to build your container image. So uh, Docker file always starts with a from statement here. We're gonna use the base image, uh, Golang 1.21. We're gonna use the Alpine version of it, so it's a little bit smaller. Uh, the Golang uh, base image is like 800 and something megs, and the Alpine version is about 200. Uh, with this Docker file, we're going to set a label, some, meta, some metadata for this container image, uh, project equals cloud data essentials, uh, set where the, work, where, where the working directory is to slash app, <clears throat> copy some files over, uh, run uh, go mod and go build to create our application, uh, expose port 8080, and uh, then start the container with the command simple app to run our application. <clears throat> so we're gonna use Docker build to create our application. So uh, Docker build takes your Docker file and goes through line, line, line by line and creates your, your container image. 
Let's take a look to see if our image is available locally. So we do that with uh, Docker image LS, and we see that uh, simple app uh, image here with the tag 0 0.1 and our ID, and it was created about seven minutes ago. We're going to test running this container as uh, this, con this container image. So we'll do a Docker run. We'll give it the name simple app. Otherwise, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a short hash for the name. Or I'm sorry, it's going to be a different, it's in its own uh, equation of a name, so which is the names from Docker are usually pretty funny. Uh, expose uh, port 8080 on the, on the host and direct traffic to 8080 on the container. We'll run it in detach as well. Uh, so we are not in that container, and once we stop it, it will remove that container. So that's what that dash dash rm uh, option is, and we are using the simple app uh, container image. So we test it here as well. See our uh, container image is nice and running. So let's uh, stop this container. Uh, this container with Docker stop simple app. Uh, next, so we are going to install Harbor, and Harbor requires, for this version of, or this way of, an, of Harbor, uh, uses Docker Compose. Uh, like I said before, there's multiple ways to uh, install all, any of these CNCF graduated projects. Uh, for this way of Harbor, we're going to use Docker Compose, so let's install Docker Compose. Uh, before we actually proceed, so our setup of Harbor is not going to use HTTPS uh, because we, there is many steps for, uh, through OpenSSL uh, to use HTTPS uh, when you install Harbor. So uh, in order to actually use Harbor as a container registry, not with only with HTTP, uh, Docker actually requires all the container registry it, it uh, pulls and pushes from has to be secure. So we actually have to create a file under uh, slash etsy slash docker, a uh, file is called uh, daemon.json to actually add an insecure registries um, entry into that file. So we are going to click on this, this sudo t to create that slash etsy slash docker slash daemon.json uh, and we're gonna add in the, uh, an entry for insecure registries with our uh, Harbor instance here. And notice that it should be your harbor.publicip uh, and using slip.io. So once that's done, we have to reload and restart Docker. So let's do that with sudo systemctl daemon reload and sudo systemctl restart Docker. So next, we could actually install Harbor. So once we have uh, Docker and Docker Compose up and running and also set up to use HTTP only, we can install Harbor. Uh, so we will do a uh, for the with for the Harbor archive uh, on GitHub. So once that's done, uh, we will download the ASC file to check to make sure it is correct. And we'll obtain the public key uh, for this ASC file. Then we'll use the gpg command uh, to check to see if our archive is correct. And we should see a good signature from Harbor sign here. Uh, so we, our archive is great. We could install, now we could extract the installer. So let's ins extract the installer. Uh, so before we actually start up Harbor, there's a configuration file called harbor.yaml. Uh, and Harbor gives us a template uh, for this harbor.yaml. So we need to copy it over and create our own version of the harbor.yaml uh, configuration file. There's a few things we need to, we need to change in this harbor.yaml as well. Uh, we need to uh, change the default host name of where our harbor instance is going to be. So we're using said to change uh, reg.mydomain.com into harbor.yourpublicipaddress.slip.io. And we also um, commented out the HTTPS portion as well with the last said command here. 
So next, we will actually use the install.sh to actually install and also start up Docker, I mean, Harbor. So this will take a few minutes to pull the images. So now we're pulling various uh, Harbor images uh, that's required to, uh, to run Harbor. And we'll wait for that to complete here. So we'll take a few minutes. And do a Docker PS just to check to see if we have our Harbor images running. Then next is to actually log into Harbor from the from command line by using Docker to log in to the container registry. So we'll do Docker login uh, and our Harbor URL, which is harbor.yourpublicip.sf.io. Uh, so we're going to log in with the default credentials, uh, admin, and Harbor one two three four five. So login succeeded, which is great. That means we can access uh, our Harbor instance uh, from our local or from this machine. What port is uh, should be, it runs on 80. Um, you should access through 80 right, for this instance. Right. So we are going to, um, Skip a step here. All right, yeah. So we will ins uh, log into Harbor. So let's log into the UI of Harbor. Uh, there's a link, and log into the UI of Harbor with the default credentials. We are going to create a project for our container image. So just click on uh, New Project and enter Cloud Native Essentials. We are going to change the, uh, the access level to public. We don't really need to, because what that does is that uh, we, don't, we would have to, uh, to do a Docker login from that machine uh, to access this, this repository. So once we have our project uh, up and installed into uh, Harbor, we could now push our container image into uh, that into that Harbor instance and into that repository. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we have to give the tag or change a tag or of our container image uh, to also reflect uh, the Harbor instance and the repository as well. So we'll do a Docker tag. We'll take the container image that we created, simple app uh, tag 0 0.1, and we'll give it the, the tag of our Harbor instance, uh, repo Cloud Native Essentials. So we now will do a Docker push to push our container image into uh, the instance of Harbor. All right, so check in your Harbor UI to see if that image is available. So we want to go back to Harbor, uh, go to Cloud Native Essentials, and we see our simple app container image there. Next, let's uh, pull this container image from that Harbor instance, but we want to remove the existing local uh, container images for this simple app. So we'll do a Docker image RM for both the container images that we currently have. Then we'll test it with a Docker run. And this time we'll use the, uh, hard, the instance on Harbor um, in the Cloud Native Essentials repository. So we'll do a Docker run, give it the same name, simple app, uh, port 880 to 880, detach R RM as well, and we'll give it uh, to that. All right, and this one, I think I actually have an application, the Golang application is still running, so it may not uh, run, but we still have the application running here. All right, then do a Docker stop uh, simple app if your container was up and running to, uh, to stop that container.
All right, now that we've done the container basics and we've been able to build a container image, push it up to Harbor, and pull it back down, we'll get into some of the Kubernetes requirements first. As you see here, Cgroups v2, IP table, SOCAT, and contract. We'll install those, then we'll walk through and get Kubernetes installed. To begin with, we're going to start with Cgroups v2 here on the install. You see it on the left there. We're going to run a command that's stat fc command. You should see it return Cgroup2 file system, Cgroup2fs, that's going to show up there. If you see that, we're good. If you don't see that, well, you shouldn't see that. So that should all be good. Uh, next, we'll forward IPv4 and IP tables bridge traffic. So go ahead and click to run there. And what we're doing here is creating a uh, file, k8s.conf, in that modules load.d directory, putting in overlay and brnet filter. Scrolling down now a little bit, there's another click to run command, the mod probe command, where we're going to install overlay and brnet filter as those kernel modules. Let's go ahead and run that. And then we have another command just below that to set up some syscontrol parameters there. And finally, we can put those into place with syscontrol dash dash system. So that should spit out all the different parameters that we've changed there. Applying syscontrol.conf, you'll see a bunch of stuff come out. And then we can run lsmod, and we'll grep for that brnet filter and overlay to make sure both of those kernel modules have been installed. So your output should look something like that, where probably in red or a different color, you'll have highlighted the overlay and brnet filter. Scroll down a little bit, and we will double check and make sure that our uh, syscontrol parameters have been changed. So we'll check with syscontrol and put in those parameters. You'll see they're all set to one, so we're good to go there. Now we scroll down to the bottom, and we have to install two additional tools, SOCAT and CONTRAC. Uh, SOCAT helps redirect traffic within the Kubernetes cluster, and we use CONTRAC uh, to track connection information between pods and services. So with an apt install, SOCAT and CONTRAC, dash Y, we can get those installed there. Moving on to the next step, in order for us to install Kubernetes, we obviously have to have a container runtime for that to work. So we're going to use container D here and get that up and running. Uh, step one has us download the actual container D uh, gzip tarball there. So you'll see that pull down should be pretty quick. And we'll pull also the SHA-256 sum, and then we'll check that. We'll use SHA-256sum-c, and you should see an OK spit out there to compare that SHA sum to what we downloaded. If you don't see OK, scroll back up. You can click and download that tarball again, just to make sure that you've got it um, downloaded and uh, uh, cryptographically verified is what it hashed I'm looking for. Next, extract the container D archive into user local. So we'll run that sudo tar command, and we'll take out container D, the run C shim, and all that stuff. So you'll see that expected output um, from the tar extract. Since we're going to use system D to run container D, we're going to download the container D.service unit file. So click to run that sudo wget on step number four. Once we've downloaded that, we're automatically placing it in that container D directory. So then we can just run system control daemon reload. And finally, enable dash dash now to start the container D container runtime. With that up and running, we'll need to install run C and also do the SHA-256 verification. So we can follow those steps here to wget run C, get its signature, and then we'll do the sudo install. Now that we've installed run C, container D uses a configuration file called config.toml, T-O-M-L, to specify daemon level options. The config.toml file is going to be located at that Etsy container D location. We'll create the location by using that make p command. And then container D provides a command for us, container D config default. So we'll execute that to get the default configuration options spit out into a format we can use. And then we'll pipe those using T and create that in Etsy container D. What we'll need to do there in step 10 is set the system D C group driver with run C. So you see we have a sed command that inline is going to change that for us in that config.toml file. And finally, we can use system control restart container D to take those changes, apply them, and restart the container runtime. Once we've done that, we move on to our next step. And we're going to need to install, I think I went just ahead. Oh, I'm good. Uh, we're going to need to install our uh, container networking interface. Ray talked a little bit earlier. We're going to use Cilium in this, and we won't be able to have any communication between pods and services or the kubelet and anything else before we install this container runtime, or excuse me, this uh, networking interface. The first thing we'll do is set a couple of environment variables. We're going to install version 1.3.0. We're using AMD64 architecture, and our destination is that opcni bin location. So we'll make that directory, and then we'll click and download this. Once we've downloaded the CNI, then we'll run the Kubernetes prerequisites called cry ctl, cry control. 
This is a CLI for CRI compatible runtimes, container runtimes, excuse me, of which container D is one. So we'll export a few more uh, environment variables here, make that directory, and then download that CRI CTL. Finally, down at the bottom, you should see a crycuddle, crycontrol dash dash version. And if you click to run that, you should have an output crycuddle version v1.28.0. Now that we have the CNI tool installed and we have crycuddle installed, we can do the Kubernetes installation. Once the Kubernetes installation is complete, the pods still won't be able to talk to each other because we haven't yet installed Cilium. We just laid the groundwork for doing that in the previous step. So we'll start here by checking the latest Kubernetes version with this curl command, and that's grabbing download.kates.io and that's stable.txt file. We see 128.3 is our latest version. So let's take that 128.3 and put that along with our architecture and the release version that we specified there into these environment variables. We'll change directory into our downloader, and then we'll actually download a bunch of Kubernetes tools, kubeadm and kubelet specifically. We will run sudo chmod plus x, and that's going to add the executable bit to those files. And then we'll want to download the kubelet systemd unit file. So you can click to run that curl command there. We're going to use systemd to run the kubelet. So that will uh, maintain its lifecycle for us, get it operational, have the watchdog and everything that systemd brings. We'll make a directory for our kubelet, and then we will put that content in there and run that other curl command. Expected output should download all that stuff with that unit file, and then you should be able to run system control enable dash dash now kubelet, and the symlink is created, and now the kubelet is actually running. So at this point, we have the kubelet installed on this node. It's gonna be in a crash loop situation because it doesn't have an API server to talk to. There's no CNI installed, nothing like that. So none of the prerequisites have been met, but we do have a kubelet here that's ready to start containers on this host once it gets connectivity to the Kubernetes cluster. So let's use kubectl, and then in a few minutes, we'll use kubeadm to actually set that cluster up. To start with, we'll install kube control by downloading that binary. We'll download the checksum, and then run that SHA-256 sum to make sure the cube control downloaded okay. Again, if you don't get an okay there, run the download one more time. Then we'll use sudo install, and we will install cube control, and we should be able to then finally run test cube control. And if we pass that dash dash client argument, we're not gonna reach out to the Kubernetes server, so we won't have to connect to an API that isn't working at this point. And by running cube control version, we see we've got 128.3, that's that latest version of Kubernetes. If we scroll down and we run kube control cluster info, we're gonna get a bunch of messages here about not being able to connect to the Kubernetes API. We can't reach this host on this port. That is all expected. We do that to highlight the fact that, again, we have kube control to interact with the Kubernetes API, but the other end of that connection, the kube config file, the actual Kubernetes API itself, not up and running yet. And the next step is where we will get those things going. So we click next and on step 12, finally create a cluster with kubeadm. The first step we're gonna do, since we installed kubeadm in the previous step, is execute a dry run to make sure everything we've done up to this point is okay. So we execute kubeadm in it, we pass the socket, that CRI socket, that kubeadm is going to use to connect to our container runtime and actually start containers and configure the host. We pass the dry run argument, just to make sure that everything is sane. We're not going to apply any of these changes. And then I appended an and and echo dry run okay. So if that previous command succeeds, you should see dry run okay show up at the bottom. If you don't, take a look back in some of the previous steps. The error message that may or may not show up might have information for you. But hopefully you've clicked all the same boxes we have, so you should have dry run okay show at the bottom. If the dry run is successful, then we basically do the exact same command on step number two there, but without the dry run argument attached. This is actively going to communicate with that CRI socket, start containers, and get the Kubernetes cluster up and running. We haven't yet installed the CNI, we have Cilium yet to go. So once this Kubernetes install completes, we will be able to interact with the API, but our node will remain in an unready status and we will not yet have pod to pod communication. So don't fear if you're stepping a few steps ahead of us and you're like, oh no, this isn't working, we're gonna get there. So after just a minute or two, we now see the kubeadm join command shows up at the bottom, and that's what we could use to join other nodes if we had multiple nodes that we wanted to join to this cluster. You see it says follow the instructions from the end of the kubeadm init command to copy the kubeconfig file into a specific location. We've automated that with the click to run. 
So you do that click to run command and it's going to take our cube config file, put it into the dot cube directory in your home uh, directory on your system. And then the cube control tool automatically looks in that directory for that config file. Then step three, we can use cube control cluster info. And you click that and we see the Kubernetes control plane is running at blah, blah, blah. Core DNS is running at blah, blah, blah. To further diagnose problems, you can do blah, blah, blah. So that means kube control has now been able to access the Kubernetes API. We have details about where that API lives, where the core DNS endpoints are. So we know we're able to talk to part of Kubernetes. Now, if we scroll down, we want to click that taint of the node and untaint the control plane node there. You see the step kube control taint nodes dash dash all, and we're gonna remove the taint on the control plane node. Finally, if you click cube control get nodes, you should see a single node that's showing up in our Kubernetes cluster. Plain vanilla Kubernetes, you've got the IP address host name showing up there. Our status again is still not ready. We have to get the pod networking going, but you see the control plane role there, the age of the node, and we're running version 128.3. If we click next, now we'll do our Cilium install and get ready to rock with actually communicating between pods. First thing to do is install the latest Cilium CLI. So click to run at the top. It's gonna to export a few different environment variables, download that Cilium CLI tool, and then we can click to run Cilium install dash dash version 114.2. That's going to auto detect the Kubernetes API again using that cube config file. And we're going to install Cilium as the CNI into that cluster. Next thing to do is click on Cilium status dash dash wait. This command is going to take a few minutes to complete. And what's happening in the background here is the Cilium uh, status dash dash wait tool, excuse me, argument to the Cilium tool is going to check through the Kubernetes cluster and ensure that the Cilium pods have been started that they're correctly interfacing with the host, that they're configuring things like IP tables rules, that there's communication correctly between pods. And you'll see here now, after a few moments, the output shows with the little colored, you know, thing there with the butterfly or whatever it is. Cilium's okay, the operator's okay, everything else is good to go. Now, if you scroll down just below that output on the left, there's a cube control get nodes command. You run that, boom, our node is now ready. So we've transitioned from a not ready state to a ready state just by getting that container networking interface up and running. Cilium's installed, so therefore the node's good to go. It's ready to receive workloads. In fact, if we click on cube control git pods dash n cube dash system, which is a click to run there, we see there's already a bunch of pods running in our cluster. We have the Cilium operator and the single node from the daemon set there. We have core DNS for providing DNS services in the cluster. FED is running for our storage and the cube API server and other various components that comprise the Kubernetes control plane. Keep going. Okay. Now that we've got our Kubernetes cluster up and running, let's learn about some of the basics, creating a namespace, deploying some workloads, things like that. The first thing to do is create a Kubernetes namespace. A namespace isolates a group of resources within a Kubernetes cluster. So you can think about it as being a device for logical segmentation of resources. So I can take pods, services, um, config map secrets, whatever, and I can group them together using this namespace construct. We'll use the click to run here to create our namespace. And that should output then cube control create namespace my dash namespace. Once we've got our namespace created, let's actually start a container inside that namespace. So we'll run cube control run nginx, and we pass a couple arguments there. The image argument tells us what image we want to use, and by virtue of not passing a specific repository, we're gonna use the Docker Hub to download that nginx image. We also pass a port argument that says Kubernetes should expect traffic to arrive on this pod on port 80. And finally, that dash n says, hey, Kubernetes, deploy that pod into the namespace we just created. You should see an output that looks like pod nginx created. And then we have a command just below it where we can actually get the IP address of that pod inside of our uh, cluster and run a curl command to access the nginx web server running inside that pod. The output then, as you see, we've done a little truncation using the head command, welcome to nginx. If you actually wanted to see what the IP address of that pod was, you could run a command like cube control get pods dash n my dash namespace and then dash o wide. That is the wide output format. No resources found in, oh, I had a little typo. We'll change that there. And now you see the IP address of my single pod is 10.00.215. 
Yours may or may not be the same, but you see how we're getting to that curl command and actually accessing the traffic. Finally, on step number five, let's delete the pod in the my dash namespace. We want to get rid of that because we're going to move down to the next Kubernetes concept, which is a deployment. A deployment is a Kubernetes resource that provides declarative updates at a controlled rate for pods. So this time, we're going to create a Kubernetes manifest and use that to roll out our pod as part of this deployment instead of creating it directly. First, let's make a manifests directory inside of our home dir on this workstation. Once we've done that, there's a click to run file here. Before you click to run, or you can do it now if you want, you can take a look at the structure of that file. This describes a Kubernetes resource. You'll see at the top the API version. It describes that we're using the apps API, which is a core API component from Kubernetes, and it's version one. The kind of resource we're describing here is a deployment. Then everything below that section is specific to this resource. So we're creating the Nginx deployment. You see the name there. We're putting it in the namespace of my dash namespace. We've added some labels to it to describe, hey, maybe we want to look up all Nginx related apps. We can use querying methods and actually Kubernetes resources themselves can use querying methods based on those labels that we apply there. Underneath the spec section, we describe how we want our pods to be created. So we're going to create two replicas of this Nginx pod. We have a selector there, again, with that label selection ability that we have. And finally, in the template section, we describe what the actual pod manifest should be. So you're not only creating a deployment using this manifest, but you're describing inside the manifest the template or the manifest for the pod to actually use. So it's sort of one within the other kind of thing. Now that we've created that manifest file, we can use cube control apply, which is the command to read in manifests and deploy them. And if you click to run that, we see that the deployment Nginx has been created. We'll scroll down a little bit and we can use cube control git deployment. And we pass in dash n my dash namespace and we see we have a single deployment called Nginx. There's two out of two ready. So up to date two, available two. What that means is our replica count in the manifest was set to two. This means we want to have at any one time two pods running. We have two of two running, so we're good to go. The deployment has done its job. It's reconciled. It's done that declarative configuration thing we touched on. Now that we've done that, we scroll down. We can use git pods in the my namespace. And there we see our two pods, each with different IP addresses. Instead of accessing the Nginx web server running in each one of these pods directly, we're going to use something called a service. A service defines a uh, abstraction to group a number of pods together. You can think about it in a very, very simplistic way as being a static IP address. Pods are mortal. They live and die. So we expect a pod to disappear at any one time, another pod to take its place. So we don't always want to send traffic to a single pod if it's going to disappear. We can use a service instead to target a pod based, again, on that labeling mechanism we talked about in order to route traffic to those pods. So think about it as just a static reference, a static IP, if you want. There are other types of services for groups of pods. We'll create a service manifest here. So you can click to run on that file that's there. Once you've created that service manifest, you can click to run kubectl apply, and we'll input that service.yaml. With that Nginx service created, you can use kubectl git service, and that shows that we have a node port service running. That means that on our Kubernetes node here, we are exposing port, in this case, 30,000, and we should be able to add, or excuse me, send traffic from our workstations to port 30,000 and get an Nginx pod to show up. In fact, there's a link, kubernetes.dip address. If you click on that, welcome to Nginx. And this is going to load balance. That service will automatically do it between the two different pods that are there. So if I decrease the replica count, if I increase the replica count, if one of them goes unavailable, we should see the traffic automatically switch over each request to go to a different pod as availability determines. So we'll close that. Hit next. OK. All right, next we're going to install Helm. Uh, Helm is the, the package manager for Kubernetes, and we're going to install, install and use Helm uh, in the later step as well. Uh, so we're going to install Helm. We're just, we're just, we'll just use a, do a curl command to get Helm. Uh, we'll do a Helm version client just to test to see, make sure uh, Helm is installed correctly. Yes, we do have Helm 3.13.1. Uh, and let's go to the next step. That was a short one. Uh, next, we'll go into observability. So uh, there's three uh, columns of, of observability. We will uh, touch on metrics first, 
and we are going to use Helm to install Prometheus. We're actually going to use what's called the QPrometheus stack, which is a community maintained Helm chart uh, to not just install uh, Prometheus, but its batteries included. So it installs the Prometheus operator, uh, and actually it gives you Prometheus rules as well, alert manager for alerting, uh, Grafana to visualize uh, your, your metrics. Uh, we'll also install several things that are required uh, for Prometheus to pull metrics like cube state metrics and the node exporter. Uh, so we, before we actually install uh, the Q Prometheus stack, we need to add the Helm repository, the, uh, the Prometheus community uh, Helm uh, repository with the Helm repo add. And typically after you, uh, you add in a Helm repository, you typically want to do Helm repo updates, or if you're going to update your Helm charts, you always want to do Helm repo updates. Then we'll, do, uh, we'll use Helm install to install the Q Prometheus stack. Uh, we will do a help install Q Prometheus stack uh, from the Prometheus community's Q Prometheus uh, stack uh, repository. We're going to set uh, some, a few overrides with a dash dash set option. Dash dash set will uh, override several options here, like we'll create a node port services instead of cluster IP, so we could uh, access several services from our, from our local machine. So let's do a Helm install. This will take a, a few minutes here. I'll just go through some of this Helm install as well. We'll, uh, we'll override, like I said, uh, the node port type of service instead of cluster IP. Uh, we'll also create the namespace, the Q Prometheus stack, where all the resources are going to be uh, installed at. Uh, we'll also uh, do a namespace override for that namespace as well. Uh, same thing for Grafana as well. Um, same thing for cube state, cube state metrics and uh, the node exporter. So once uh, the Q Prometheus stack is finished installing, we'll, uh, we'll check to see how the pods are doing and how are they running. This, this will take a few minutes or a minute to actually get the pods up and running. Uh, so we will uh, use keep control, the dash dash and namespace, uh, Q Prometheus stack, get pods, and we'll take a look at the Prometheus uh, pods with the dash L labor, label filter. Uh, so we have the pods running for Prometheus. Uh, let's take a look at the services for, for the Q Prometheus stack as well. So we'll do a get, uh, keep control, get services for, uh, in that Q Prometheus stack. So that looks like our services are up and running. We have several node ports that we will use to access uh, Prometheus. So let's, uh, do, uh, let's click on the link that will uh, to the port uh, 390, and as you see from the output of that, of that services, uh, 390 is that uh, Q Prome is that node port for the for for Prometheus. So we should have Prometheus uh, up and running, and should have access to it. Uh, we do give you a simple prom QL uh, expression to run as well, and this uh, prom QL expression shows the total amount of CPU uh, spent over the last five minutes. So we could run that quickly here. And executes, and we should get an output. All right, going back to Hobby Farm, uh, so uh, we could also take a look at Grafana as well. So let's uh, click the link to Grafana, which is on port uh, 30140. We do need to log into Grafana, which, which is admin and the prompt operator password. It's still loading Grafana, so it's still. The pods are probably still loading here, so we'll give it a minute here. All right, so let's log into Grafana. And Grafana does come in with a number of built-in dashboards. Of course, you could always create your dashboard as well. Uh, you could also export and migrate dashboards, so they are just config maps. We'll go on the uh, hamburger menu here, we'll go to dashboards. Let's go to Kubernetes and let's take a look at the kubelets. So here we could take a look to see that we have, in this cluster, we have one kubelet. Of course, we have a, a single node cluster. It's running 17 pods. And Windows 17 pods is running 30 containers. And we could see some metrics here with this kubelet uh, dashboard here. So uh, the last step uh, is uh, policy. So we are going to install 
uh, OPA gatekeeper. Uh, so of course, uh, Open Policy uh, Agents is a CNCF graduated project. Uh, gatekeeper, uh, I find it easier to customize uh, the webhook uh, with using Gatekeeper, and we'll take a look and see uh, why that is. So uh, we are going to install Gatekeeper from uh, using Helm as well. So we'll add the Gatekeeper. We'll add the Open Policy Agents uh, Helm repository or Helm, Helm chart repository with Helm repo add, and we'll do a Helm repo updates as well. Then we'll use Helm install to install Gatekeeper. Uh, we'll give it the name, the namespace Gatekeeper system. So once uh, Gatekeeper is up and running, a few things before we actually use Gatekeeper, it uses what's called the constraint uh, framework. Uh, with, with OPA, you actually write your policies in a language called Rego. Uh, so with Rego, we'll write our policy. In this case, we're gonna have a required uh, labels policies so we're going to have uh, specified that certain resources in Kubernetes has to have a, a specific label. So for the constraint framework, you have to have what's called a constraint template uh, for the template of that pol or that your policy, uh, and the constraint actually applies that constraint uh, template uh, and actually where you define what type of resources you want to apply that constraint template, and also what any other specifics on that constraint. Uh, template you want to run as well. So let's uh, install a constraint template. So this is for required labels here. The rego is in the bottom here that says that we will just, we will require specific labels. So once that is installed, we'll uh, do a few tests as well. Uh, we'll uh, install the, the first one, it will install the constraints to enforce this that policy on namespaces, and we want to have a label with a key owner. So any new namespace must have a label with a key owner. So let's test this uh, constraint uh, out. So we will attempt to create a namespace, but this time we will have a label of owner, owner equals you. And so with this, we expect the namespace to be created. Next, let's test this constraint again with a namespace without any labels. So we'll try to create a namespace uh, with only uh, no, label, no labels at all, just with a name. So now we get an error. So error from server forbidden. So this, so open, OPA Gatekeeper has worked that it enforces our guardrails and our policy that says that you must have a label on namespaces with the key uh, equals owner. All right, and that's it for our hands-on portion. I know we have quite a bit of time, so we're here for questions and also any help for any folks that are stuck on any steps here. Uh, if you want to come up as well, feel free and we'll uh, answer any questions. I know there's spikes around as well, but you can also feel free to come up to us. All right, thank you. All right, thank you for your time. Uh, we apologize for, the <laughs> for, for the, uh, some issues early on, but uh, the steps are on GitHub. Uh, the YouTube playlist is on GitHub. I mean, the link is on GitHub as well, so you can take a look to see how those uh, scenarios will run. Sorry. So, so this, this item is going to be available until next how many days This scenario was only going to be available until it's actually short lived, so it'll probably be like 4 30 or 4 o'clock. So. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but the steps are available to go right in on any virtual machine to run. Uh, for this hobby's yeah. farm star. So these virtual machines will only stay up until 4.30, but if you go to github.com slash cloud native essentials, all the content, including the slides, yep. is all there. the slides, the and hobby the, farm steps. The steps are yeah. in markdown format, so you can replicate them on whatever VM you'd like. Yeah, it's a markdown, and you can actually see the actual hobby farm scenario as well, so yeah. you can see everything in uh, yep. github.com uh, slash cloud native essentials. Yeah, oh, so it's, already, it's already there. It's right there in PowerPoint and uh, PDF as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Right. So I came in late. Can I still get into this uh, start scenario? 